Hey, Robert Rathalf here again, and talking about the last module in the um, in the course on the Bible. And what we want to talk through now is this idea of canonical, apocryphal, and pseudographal. Now, some of you may have never even heard of those terms before, um, but I think it's important to explore what those actually mean. If we start to investigate the different writers in the Bible and the various different writers that did not make it in the Bible, we can start to classify them as canon or part of the biblical canon. That means um, part of what we consider the Bible. Now, we um, had the Old Testament, right? People uh, accepted that readily. That um, was very clearly uh, delineated and, and defined in terms of um, its lineage. The New Testament was formed, as we talked about earlier, from journals and uh, letters from the church founders. And it's interesting to kind of think about, well, which of those um, and how do those decide to become canonical? Um, because it is an obvious fact that um, in Luke 1, verse 1 through 4, it even says that it's no surprise that many people are writing down the words of Jesus, right? But not all were preserved that made it into the Bible. Many have taken in hand, many have written a declaration of those things, okay? So what that means is that there was a lot of additional writings that the apostles maybe even quoted <clears throat> or held in high regard um, that were not part of, you know, the Hebrew Tanakh, that were not part of um, the manuscripts got taken into um, ultimately uh, the Bible. And so we had journals and letters and books written before the writings of Jesus and um, more writings after um, or during when Jesus was on earth. So these are divided into three buckets and we're going to dive into each. Um, the three buckets are the pseudiographer, right, the apocrypha, and the canon, the canonical. We'll start with the pseudiographer. So the pseudiographer is a term um, applied to works that have false attribution. In other words, they've been written by someone that they ultimately claim, um, someone other than who they claim to be, okay? And so pseudiographer also anglicizes as pseudepigrapha, right? Or uh, ultimately it just means falsely attributed works. And so the texts that were claimed by an author that was not the true author, or a work whose real author was attributed to a figure of the past, those are all the pseudiographer. Now, we have a lot of these, right? So the more, um, you know, there's the Book of Enoch that people, some people really hold on to. Um, there's a number of different, you know, the Gospel of Judas and the Gospel of Thomas. And, and so why then, um, you know, are these not um, accepted, right? Well, we'll talk about that in a little bit, but ultimately, when the book contains information that can either be proven historically as not alignment, um, if it was written on, um, you know, written in a way that was clearly, um, you know, contradicting the Bible, um, you know, there's a lot of different ways, a lot of different things, and we're going to talk about, you know, these individually, but ultimately, this kind of group of content um, can really just be kind of thrown in the trash, right? This is stuff that is people who have written these and um, they're either just not inspired um, or they are outright uh, counterfeits in lives. Now, the last group, and we're going to talk about the second group, um, you know, the last group um, is the canonical. And this is, you know, the other side of the spectrum, right? This is what has been, you know, without question, divinely inspired. These are people that have either been, um, you know, directly, um, you know, hearing the words from Jesus, a um, number of different um, ways to break this down. And so we find that you know, in this group, uh, Paul's letters, uh, you know, Jude, James, and John's letters, um, you know, and the journal of Jesus' followers. So a lot of these are going to be, you know, does the book have as thus saith the Lord? Was it written by a prophet or someone with the gift of prophecy, uh, such as, you know, David, Solomon, Ezra, things like that, or an apostle, someone actually witnessed a risen Christ? Was it accepted and used extensively in the church fellowship? You know, did it transform lives and bring people to knowing Christ? And uh, does it agree with other established scriptures? Okay, so those are kind of five main things to be looking at. And ultimately, um, that's how our New Testament was formed, was based on um, a series of different texts. So what about the Apocrypha? <clears throat> is it inspired? Is it trash? What is this? And 
I think to understand this, um, you know, the, the Apocrypha is ultimately biblical or related writings that are not accepted as canon, um, but ultimately maybe have, um, um, you know, seem like they are in alignment with the Bible in some instances and some not. Um, when we go through this list, I think it's kind of interesting because I always wondered, well, you know, should I know about these? Who decided these were not part of uh, the Bible? And, and even when we look at, um, you know, when Martin Luther, who was a Catholic priest, you know, he started to see the light and, you know, started the protest against the Catholic Church. And when he assembled his Bible, he accepted the journals of Jesus' followers, the letters of Paul, except for Hebrews, um, which was likely not clear to him yet. Uh, Luther also was not sure about Jude or James, and even the Revelations of John, as it seemed like too kind of mythical for him. So while he included them, he actually moved them to the end of the Bible. And I believe God has had his hand in this directly, as Revelation needed to be at the end in order to form the symmetry you know, that God had in mind. But what's interesting is that when we looked at Martin Luther's Bible, it started with the Old Testament, then it had the Old Testament Apocrypha, then it had the New Testament, and then the New Testament Apocrypha, right? Which ultimately he identified as, he didn't call them Apocrypha, but he put them at the end, and that was uh, Hebrews and and um, and uh, Revelations, etc. So it's important to note that Martin Luther's Bible moved several of the books um, to the end of the Old Testament and labeled them as less than canon. Um, examples were... Um, you know, that we mentioned already, James, Jude, Revelation, Hebrews, as well as uh, First and Second Ezra were removed entirely. So if we look at kind of what the structure of, the, of his Bible looked like, ultimately we see the Apocrypha, in, you know, at the end of the Bible had uh, Tobit and Judith and Sirach and Baruch, uh, you know, Baruch and Songs of the Three Children, etc., etc., etc. The disputed ones, Hebrew, James, Jude, Revelation, and then First and Second Ezra was just removed entirely. So then, um, you know, if we were, to, we were to read here, and this is um, um, a uh, Bible Encyclopedia, the in investigation which follows shows that when the word apocryphal was first used in ecclesiastical writings, it bore a sense of virtually identical with esoteric, so that the apocryphal writings, such as appeal to the inner circle, could not be understood by outsiders. And the present connotation of the term did not get fixed in the Protestant resolution, uh, Reformation and set in. So ultimately, um, you know, there's some, um, uh, you know, the apocryphal writings are the uttermost important for a correct understanding of the Jewish uh, problem of the day when they were written, right? So this is this idea that many of these books were not considered inspired, um, but were considered historically accurate. As an example, Maccabees. Maccabees has some issues, I believe, but it is historically giving an accurate depiction of the rise of, of the Maccabean uh, Wars. So um, I believe that you know, there's a purpose for them. And that's, you know, um, there's also there's a reason they're not in the Bible. So um, the same authority was never ascribed to these, these, um, these books, um, to the Old and New Testament, uh, as was to the Old and New Testament, um, until the Council of Trent. So, there is just an interesting piece here. Uh, if you've taken the last video, you'll understand that there was a significant infiltration um, and uh, perversion of the Bible by the Catholic Roman Catholic Church. And so I wanted to get a sense for myself, right, study to show yourself approved of if any of these books were, um, had any, you know, were worth looking at. And so the first thing I did was I started kind of mapping them out based on uh, which of the books were accepted by which religions. And what I find is that um, the Roman Catholic Bible did not include First or Second Ezra, did not include uh, Prayer of Manasseh, and did not include the later uh, Maccabees or Psalm 51. So that was interesting to me. Greek Orthodox also did not include Second Ezra, and the Coptic and Russian Orthodox did not include the Fourth Maccabees. Um, you know, there is a little bit of a, you know, is the enemy of my enemy my friend sort of thing. So I would assume that if books that are not endorsed by the Catholic Church, 
they wouldn't have invented them and not put, then not put them into their Bible. So to me, I'm interested of the books that are not endorsed by the Roman Catholic Church. Um, not to say that the other ones are not valid, but just those are the ones that interest me the most. So I kind of started looking at, okay, um, which books were, um, you know, uh, we get we get first and second Ezra's, Manasseh's, Maccabees, one fifty one. Okay. Now again, the Apostle Paul, you know, noticed that the enemy, even during his time, was trying to create false doctrines. So it's really important that we don't just you know just jump in and accept any um, thing that's not in the canon uh, as truth without really carefully studying it and studying it we're in a very guarded way with the Holy Spirit impressing you. So we can just start taking these books, and as we start reading through them, we can figure out what's biblical and not biblical. And you know there are some imaginative com- uh, you know concepts which are not supported anywhere in the Bible, such as you know um, burying fallen angels in a hole in the desert. Right in Enoch, uh, we read the investigation, the invention of names of like eighteen angels that are not found anywhere else. So maybe this is taking liberties. But the real issue that kind of disqualifies the book of Enoch for me was uh, in verse seven, two, chapter seven, verse two, where the book claims that fallen angels had intercourse with humans and created these you know huge giants that ate people. So and that's in verse uh, seven, thirteen. If we read the Bible, what the Bible has to say in Matthew twenty thirty, it says that angels are not sexual beings and cannot reproduce. So if the Bible, sorry, if any word is taken out of, con- it, it ultimately contradicts the Bible, then there's no light in it. Now, um, we are not to despise prophesy, okay? So we'll make that clear. But also, um, if it is not in alignment with the word, there's no light in them. Another example here is a different book uh, where we see that it's not supported, right? This idea of pouring water three times upon the head. This is not supported teaching by Jesus. And there are many examples of people who are baptized without fasting first, and all the instances of baptism with full immersion. So this is questionable, and it goes against what the Bible has to say. Another example, Tobit. Tobit talks about bewitching arts, which are not biblical, right? About a devil or a spirit if you trouble you, then you must make a smoke thereof. This goes against Mark 16, 17, Acts 16, 18. Um, so for me, you know, that's a strike against Tobit. Another strike is talking about buying salvation, not biblical. See for uh, Peter 1, 8, 18 and 19, right? You can't buy your way to heaven. Okay, so pretty much scratch out Tobit. Um, Second Maccabees talks about reconciling for the dead. Um, prayer for the dead is not biblical. So, you know, First John 1, 7. So again, as I kind of read through this, I started to kind of like making negative points against books that are not doctrinally sound, um, you know, that speak to, you know, eternal torment of the wicked, uh, witchcraft, works, you know, based religion, uh, or have historical errors, right? An example, Baruch 6.2 says there's seven, 70 generations, but then Jeremiah in the Bible, in Jeremiah 25.11, uh, says 70 years. So very different. Uh, Tobit 1, uh, 3 to 5 infers that um, there's 200 years. Um, but then in later, uh, in, in chapter 14, verse 1 through, it says 112 years. So if it contradicts itself in even the same book, that's another strike. Judith 1 1 says Nebuchadnezzar ruled the Assyrians, but ultimately he ruled the Babylonians and, and not from Nineveh. So more stuff that that contradicts the Bible or contradicts what is understood as historical facts. Um, and so I started kind of just like crossing out books. Um, the next is it was important to note that some of the books were um, cited by the apostles, right? That not doesn't necessarily mean they're inspired, even if they're cited by the apostles. But um, they may have been historically accurate for their time. They may have been popular culture. An example, 2 Timothy 3.8 speaks of Janus and Jambres, right? And Maccabees are historically accurate documents during the Maccabean Wars, but don't appear to be divinely inspired. Um, in Matthew 23.34, it actually seems that Jesus is quoting 2 Ezra. So there, it just to me, is, is this this idea of, you know, um, is it quoted by Jesus Right? And there's a few instances in Sirach. Um, there's a few instances where we find that. Second Ezra. 
you know, is it, are there quoting of the apostles? So Judith, um, you know, Mark 9 appears to be quoting Judith. Um, you know, it's just a similar concept. Um, also in Ezekiel 17, 3 through 8 is a direct uh, quote of Second Ezra. Um, you know, then we see, um, you know, for me, I'm looking at did Ellen White um you know, quote this, do the Adventist pioneers quote this? And we kind of see a few of these. Um, there's actually a, a, an article on uh, history of the Apocrypha written by uh, Matthew Cortman. He does a pretty good job of really going in, diving into it. And, you know, his things is that um, there ultimately were, um, you know, different books that he kind of uh, discusses. Um, and uh, really the idea ultimately is... Um, you know, that there was, and I'll skip over some of the stuff here, um, there was a few books that um, were identified from the early uh, Adventist church as uh, frequently quoted, okay? It doesn't mean that they're true, but um, I actually continue this course in another um, course on Bible prophecy as well as another course called The Hidden Book. So if you're interested in learning more about that, all I want again to really point out from this is you know, the Bible says we are to think and study for ourselves. And so we aren't to take my research or your own, res you know, your, your own research, not take my research or just my conclusions. But I do want to kind of point out that there may be more um, that we can that we can gain. Right. And um, my hope is that I'm able to give you enough terms and concepts to inspire the right questions. Um, so with that, you know, the question is, you know, is there anything valuable in those books. And I think the first thing to, again, go back to is, what is a prophet? And the Bible says that we should be guarded, but we are not uh, to immediately reject um, those that God may be speaking through. In fact, you know, we are to believe in his prophets, and the key word being his prophets. So we should be uh, aware that there are those um, who say they're from God and are not, right? And those would be false prophets. Um, again, I really recommend a book by Ellen White called The Great Controversy, and I personally believe that Ellen White is a prophet. Um, and in this, she writes that, you know, the spirit was not given nor can it be bestowed to anything that supersedes the Bible. And I really believe that uh, there is no false prophet that will say anything that supersedes the Bible, meaning that if, you, if somebody says something and it's not in a perfect alignment with the Bible, then they are wrong, not the Bible. The Bible gives us a promise that Jesus will return, but also tells us there's going to be a lot of people that are claiming to be false prophets, claiming to be Jesus even. Okay, So false prophets will arise, many false prophets will arise, believe not every spirit, many false prophets. And so this puts us really into a state of um, being very cautious, right? We can trust anything that is in the Bible canon. Okay, If it's inside of the Old Testament, the New Testament canon, it is 100% to be trusted. Um, anything outside of that needs to be questioned um, very critically. And if it disagrees with the Bible, then it is a false prophet. When we actually start thinking about what are self false prophets, because in the end times, we're going to find out that there's going to be a lot of people that are even able to bring fire down from heaven. And so we are to be clear that signs and wonders are not a test of genuineness. Right? If they do signs and wonders and bring fire out of heaven, but then say that the Sabbath is on uh, the first day of the week, which the Bible does not say, they are a false prophet. We find out that you know, in Matthew 7.22 that there were people that were prophesying and casting out devils and doing wondrous works. And Jesus will say, I never knew you. And so that means that those works are being carried about by works of darkness. So what is a true prophet? All right. A true prophet will speak with the authority of straight truth and not contradict the word of God. A true prophet will exalt Jesus as the son and savior of man. He will not speak in the name of other gods. A true prophet will be seen by their character. And this is one of the most important ones is that you'll know them by their fruits. Right. And so if they're edifying, you know, if they're exhortating, if they're comforting, right, um, if they're pointing to God and not themselves, right? People that are pointing to themselves are not of God. Do they, you know, do charity for others or do they hoard wealth for themselves, right? What are the different things 
that bring this about. Now, again, this is just a very uh, a light touching on this topic. Um, I do have another course specifically around what I think is called the hidden book. Um, it actually has a, a prophecy in it that we're going to know in about, about two years if it's right or not. And so in two years, I'm either going to burn that course or release that course. Um, but I do think that there's some interesting uh, times ahead. Ultimately, the uh, if you wanted any takeaway from me, anything that I that I think is actually important, and again, you know, look, I'm interested in understanding as much as I can understand, okay? But if you really want the real takeaway about, you know, what to be looking for, I highly recommend, more than anything I can endorse, other than the Bible itself, I highly recommend reading the works of Ellen White. Ellen White, uh, I believe, and I can um, show this in another course, um, is a prophet of God. I believe that she has um, ultimately been given the same inspiration that Paul was given, the same inspiration that John was given, right, at that level. And the same inspiration as Daniel, as Ezekiel. I count her on that level. And um, I'm not saying this in any sort of, you know, bought into any kind of weird, you know, one religion or, or one denomination even, um, I'm saying that based on just the body of work that I read of hers, the great controversy, steps to Christ, um, you know, desire of ages, um, patriarchs and prophets, prophets and kings, the Bible commentary she gives is absolutely inspired. And so um, I cannot recommend highly enough um, for you looking into Ellen White yourself. But more than anything, we're always to come back to the Word of God. And if Ellen White ever were to contradict in any of her writings, the Bible, I would throw all of her writings out, okay? Just she hasn't. She has never contradicted the Bible. But the Bible is ultimately our test. The Bible is more than just that, you know, that litmus test for what is true and what's not. The Bible is like listening to God speak to us. And it has the power and can heal and calm us, right? It's like the advice that a dad would give a child. It's the inspiration that a coach would give an athlete, right? It's the advice a mentor would give a mentee. It's the comfort that a friend would give their companion. Jesus longs to be our father. Jesus longs to be our, our, our coach, our friend, our mentor. And, you know, I just, the more I read the Bible and the more I, I read the, the words that it contains, the more peace that I feel. And, you know, Matthew eleven twenty eight 28, that says, Come unto me, all their labor and heavy laban, and I will give you rest. I cannot tell you how many times I have been stressed out. I have been just looking to myself and trying to make everybody happy, trying to do everything on my own, feeling like I'm unsupported or whatever it is. And then I just take a step back and I just take it to Jesus and then just say, God, like, I need you. I need your help. I can't do this on my own. And deadlines get moved. Um, like, you know, projects get finished. Um, and, and more interestingly, the hurt that's in my heart gets released. And nothing can do that other than the direct word of God. M you know, I think it's kind of fun is that the Bible is, yes, the Bible is a historical document. It is an accurate document history. But it's also a puzzle. You know, the Bible is like a game in a way. And I say that respectfully, but it's kind of like God's like, hey, you know, um, it's going to be a little while until, until we see each other. You know, here's a, a game for the car, the car ride, you know, and you can use the Bible. And, I, and I've, you know, I have a whole course on, on pattern matching that's literally done in the Bible where it's just, it's fun. I mean, the Bible truly has... Uh, interesting puzzles that we can unlock that are there for us. And, and the most powerful thing is, is the Bible is a love letter. And the Bible gives us, um, you know, really that, that connection uh, with our God, with our friend, and um, with our love. So um, with that, again, I, I, I highly recommend that you take that time to really look into the Bible and, and to read it with with the, the guidance of the Holy Spirit. You know, a little joke, I wish God would speak to me. And, you know, there it is. God wants to speak to us through his word. So in the next course, we're going to get into Bible truth. Uh, that's the third course in the series. 
And um, I look forward to uh, continuing this series with you. Again, this one, if you just watched this video, there's two parts uh, to this before this video. And so I recommend that you watch um, all three parts in order. And uh, I'll see you on the next course.